All right, good evening, everyone. Oh, wow. We've got a couple people on here quickly. Um, <laughs> super excited for this one. Another Thursday night, we've got Winston once again. How's it going, Winston? Good. How's everybody doing? Very Everybody's good. gearing up for uh, some spring uh, some spring fishing, I, I hope so, and, and praying that this rain comes uh, in the next couple of days. So, yeah, I'm things up for that. Up. Should be seeing, uh, I mean, already things have been pretty good, but uh, some more fish yep. hopefully soon. So, yeah, we'll see what this weather brings. But, uh, yeah, for, uh, for everyone tuning in, Winston was uh, with us a couple weeks ago now tying some steelhead flies. And so tonight we're going to kind of keep going with that theme. We're going to gonna be doing one of uh, your favorite patterns, the Ryak, right? The Ryak, yes. Yeah, so I'm going to be tying a uh, variation of a Ryak, actually a variation of uh, the gold, uh, the Eagle Rock Ryak, which was actually uh, in Chewy's book, uh, space fly, classic space flies for uh, salmon and steelhead. And uh, this is kind of my own little uh, twist and um, turn on it. And, you know, uh, I stayed pretty much with the same color concept. I uh, just uh, changed up the material, changed up, added a few little tweaks here and there that I, I find that just uh, was more my style and, and kind of made it a little bit my own. Cool, Love but uh, I do follow the same, the same, the same uh, tying principles and tying patterns of way the way the fat, the way the materials are laid down and how they're set and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah, very neat. Right. Well, for anyone who has right uh, had the chance already to to watch our previous one, definitely suggest you do. But I don't think it's going to be mandatory to watch this either. Um, this is yep. you know new new day, new fly. So yeah, um, yeah for, for anyone who who doesn't have the time, I don't see how anyone wouldn't these days. But if you didn't, a little intro on yourself, Winston, uh, kind of, you know, history, like how'd you get into this stuff? How'd you become the tire you are today? Okay. So, yeah, like I said, I, uh, picked up a spay rod probably about, you know, 10 to 12 years ago. I grew up all my life, uh, center pinning for, uh, for Great Lake Steelhead and Steelhead, uh, ever since I was seven, seven years old, six years old, I got my first center pin reel from passed down from my father you know, and shared a big passion with my father and pursued these fish all my life, you know, growing up right up until about, you know, like I said, 10, 12 years ago, got into the spay game. Uh, first, obviously, and started with, uh, you know, the whole Skagit, easier casting, more forgiving, uh, intruders, weighted flies, big, you know, intruder styles, hobo spays was a big one back in the day. I used to fish a lot. River rat squids was another big fly. I used to fish, uh, fish in the day, which is T typically just a lot of palmered uh, marabou uh, with a stinger hook and sometimes uh, lead eyes on it. I wasn't, I was never a fan of casting uh, lead eyes or weighted flies. I was just, I hated picking them up out of the water. I don't know how many people who my, do love that. <laughs> I'll be completely honest with you. I was more worried about dinging myself in the back of the head. Sure. And I was more worried that I would go, I would blow a cast and the lead eyes would hit my rod. Mm, and yeah. then I would put this massive hole because I've seen it happen into my blank so um kind of stayed away and always always pinched my barbs just in case i did get one in the back of the head it was a lot easier to pull out <laughs> yeah. uh, but then you know as as time went on and and i met uh, a good friend of mine uh pete pedos peter pedos he had a he he was always more into the classic spay flies and stuff like that so i started you know fingering his boxes a little bit and, and picking questions at him and then uh got really into the history of spay and where it originated and where it came from and and where these flies came from and why they were tied and so that really intrigued me and then i just kind of evolved into that and just you know that's all typically all i fish now is is classic spay flies or or classic inspired spay flies if you want to say you know um and then um and then, yeah, and then, you know, more progressive into the longer lines and stuff like that and, and lighter and lighter poly leaders. And that's how I typically fish now. And, uh, yeah, sometimes I, I, I don't catch that many fish, but sometimes I do run into quite a few. And uh, obviously, just like any fisherman, you have your days and you have your and you have your bad days. You have your good days, you have your bad days. So uh, just take it with a grain of salt, I guess. So that's it. Awesome. That's that's great. Yep. And, uh, you know, speaking as somebody who's fished with you a few times, you definitely, you know, for how much you downplay yourself there, you're, you, uh, you definitely put a few fish on the bank every season. So um, this is, this is going to be a, a treat to listen to for sure. All right. Wicked. Cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to tying this fly. Like I said, like this fly, uh, 
the the original pattern was was called the Eagle Rock Ryak, which is you know uh, one of I guess one of Shuey's more uh, John Shuey more one of his inventions of a of a space fly. Um, and then I, uh, just kind of put my own tweaks on it. And then, you know, I start playing around with color combos and, you know, I'll, I'll use different colored shop and on it, different color tag ends, body colors, you know, different materials in the bottom, different collars, throw it, throw a couple cheeks in there, you know, play around with it. Um, you not you don't have to be set on one, on one color and one style of fly, you know, kind of make it your own. So that's, that's, that's how I do this. So, yep. Right on. Cool. Well, uh, I'll let you jump into it there. I guess you've already kind of advanced things a little bit just to, to get the program going. But if folks yep. have questions as they go, and if I think of questions as we go, uh, I'll just shout them out to you and we'll get back to those. So if people have questions, put them down in the chat. We will uh, respond to those as soon as we can. All right. Cool. Excellent. Yep. Yours. Sounds good. All right. All right. We'll get this started now. So I have a uh, size two uh, blue heron hook here. And I am tying with an eight aught uh, Cahill color Vivas thread. Okay, so I've already, I've already, I've already put my fly on the vise. I've pinched my barb. It's just a habit of mine. I always pinch my barb before it goes on the vise, uh, especially if I'm fishing the flies. Now, if I've done, uh, I've done uh, like custom orders in the past for for anglers and stuff like that. I don't sell those flies that's pinched barbs. I I leave them on and I'll let them decide if they want to pinch their barb down and stuff. But since this is a fishing fly that is, after I'm done tying this, is going to go in my box, I have pinched my barb down. So I, I've, I've built up a um, uh, a decent amount of thread on my body here. You can see I've kind of started at uh, where a little bit, almost I'm going to take it back a little bit further here. And I've kind of just put down a little bit of a base with my thread. I find the base kind of helps grab all my fibers. They don't roll around as much on, roll around as much, as easy on me. So, uh, yeah, so I'm going to get going. So I'm just going to take my, my thread all the way back to where my thread is going to be in line with the point of my hook. A little too far, and there we go. Okay, as you can see. So we're going to start with, so uh, typically I am going to put a tag end on. So right here I have a little bit of uh, flat, small uh, tinsel. I, I, I like wrapping tag ends with uh, small tinsel because I just find it, it comes out a lot cleaner. If I was working with a uh, medium, I find that it doesn't come out as clean. Um, again, personal preference, if you want to use flat uh, medium, you can, or like a ma Maller style uh, tinsel still works just as great. But uh, this is the metallic small flat silver tinsel so i'm just going to cut off uh you know two inches three inches here Oop. and i got away from you there okay. and i am going to attach this on i'm going to tie this in on the side closest to me and i'm going to tie it up a little bit and then tie it back to anchor in my material and I'm going to stop my thread right where I have stopped, uh, essentially where I've laid down all my thread. I don't know if that's the right term for it, but uh, we'll go with it. Cut off my little tag end here. Need my other scissors. This light's killing me right here. It's like right in my eye. <laughs> we, we have lots of lights. Yeah, don't worry about that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, wrap this back down. Down the back end of my hook. Nice and tight wraps. Every time I turn, I'm making sure that each wrap is laying nice and flat with my previous wrap. Okay, like so. Okay, and I'm gonna do, so that's four, I'm gonna do five turns. And then I'm gonna come back up and repeat the process, keeping them all nice and tight, making sure not to break my tinsel on the tip of my hook, which I've done numerous times in the past. All the way up to my end point, nice and tight. Ooh. And then I'm gonna tie it in right at the top 
making sure I don't go over where I started my thread, where I ended my thread. So, like so. Ooh. Perfect. Okay. Now this, now this, now I'm gonna put a tail on here, and typically there's never really a a tail on these flies, but I like the way it's uh, the little the little accent of color it gives off the back. Um, so I'm gonna take my golden pheasant, and again, if you see my last one, a great bird that I think should always be in a in a space fisherman's uh, re repertoire of of feathers that they carry. I think a golden pheasant is just such a versatile bird. So I'm gonna pick uh, two feathers off the bottom, right around here. So that would be closer to uh, in around, I would say that's the neck area. So just little two feathers like so. One. Two. So I got my two feathers, like so. Okay, and I'm gonna go ahead and strip down about half of this feather, maybe even a little bit more. Like so, so I just got, so I end up with a little piece like this. Can you see that, Chris? Okay, so I'm gonna do that to both feathers making sure they're even in sides, which I will match up in one second. I will measure them. Let's see this one. Okay. Like this is like, this is pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Like we, uh, okay. we can see pretty well back there, I think. Okay. Probably better. Yeah. My, my picture is like really small right now. <laughs> so I, 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 I don't know if you guys can see it or not, yeah, yeah. but, uh, so as you can see, I got two pretty similar sized uh, golden pheasant breast feathers right here. So I'm gonna lay one on top of the other, one on top of the other, with the underside of the feather, so the opposite side of the concave down, and one up like so. And I'm gonna lay them on top of each other, just like this. Right, and I'm gonna work them together kind of work them together so they kind of sit nice and uniform right on top and I should end up with something like that okay and this is my tail and I'm going to tie this in right where I finished my t my my tag end again two loose wraps oh caught my finger there two loose wraps third one around tighten it up Come back, make sure everything's sitting nice and on top, and then tie it in, like so. Can you guys uh, see that? Perfect. Okay. Uh, kind of need to tie this one a little bit back more. There we go. Okay, there is my tail. I find uh, with doing the two feathers on top of that, it gives it a little bit more of a, a pop, a little bit more, uh, one, a profile is not the right word, uh, a little bit more definition of accent into it. Instead of just using the one feather, I find it, it sticks out a little bit more. Okay, now I'm gonna build uh, my body. Okay, so first, before I build all my body, I'm gonna start tying in on, I'm gonna tie in all my, my body hackle and all my ribbing, okay? So, uh, <clears throat> so for my, uh, for my, my ribbing, I have uh, medium, medium flat metallic, small oval tinsel, and a medium, oval tinsel as well okay so I'm going to start with my my medium flat uh, again about you know three inches or so cut it off uh, 
Oh, jeez. I'll deal with that later. I hate when the metallic unravels. It doesn't oh. stick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll have it. Yeah, it just uh, comes all off. Yeah. So I'm going to tie in my uh, my medium flat on the on the side of my fly closest to me. Like so. And I am going to kind of tie all of my ribs in in about the the length that I'm going to have my back half of my body just to kind of build up that body a little bit. So again, two loose wraps, third one, tighten them in. Okay, like so. And then tie this in all the way up to the side of the fly like so. I don't know if you can see that, but as you can see. Okay, so essentially where I have ended, uh, where I've tied up to where I've tied my medium flatten is essentially going to be my back half of my body and then i'm going to tie it back do you ever building um, up my body sorry to interrupt do you ever with um segmented bodies like that do you ever like use marker or anything to mark the um the intervals uh what do you mean the intervals like i mean if you're looking at tying things you know in at the halfway mark or whatever will you actually like, take like i know one trick i use is i take like a sharpie sometimes and i'll actually make a little oh. Um, I actually, no, I've never, I've never, I've never done that, Chris. Uh, I've never, I've never marked it. I've kind of just always kind of winged it. You know, I, I proportionally, I think, you know, on my fly body, that's going to be my half point or my one third point or my one quarter point and kind of go from it there. Maybe I'm off a little bit, but, uh, kind of just eyeball the fishing it. fly end of the day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's fly in the day. It's going to fish. It's hopefully catches me a fish or two, but, uh, yep. Yeah. Cool. So and then I'm now I'm going to take uh, my my uh, small oval silver oval tinsel about the same length again about uh, two to three inches and I'm going to tie this right on top basically parallel to my medium flat and this is going to be one of my ribs that just kind of follows my medium flat this is not my counter again same going to tie it in at the same length as my medium flat tinsel like so i don't know if you guys can see it but let me just tie this in a bit more so Trim this up a little bit. Okay, tie it back. You uh, froze. Now on. bring my now bring my thread all the way <clears throat> back to my at my starting point. There, you can kind of see it's. I don't know if you can see that, but my uh, follow rib, my medium tints are all kind of running parallel to each other. Okay, very nice. Now my counter. And I'm going to throw this on the opposite fly, so that the opposite side, so that's the side uh, away from me of the fly. Same size, about, you know, two to three inches. I, I'm a big fan of, I know maybe it's not the most cost effective and you might burn through materials a bit. I like to give myself a little bit more material to work with then not enough and then you know you go to wrap it and then you realize like you're getting really close and really short on your on your turns and you know ends up slipping out of your out of your hackle pliers or out of your fingers you know and then you kind of got yourself a little bit of mess yeah i find the worst one for uh for me is floss i'm terrible at judging like, like yeah. pencil's pretty straightforward but when you're doing floss especially if you do like over and back uh, yeah yeah, always give yourself like way more than you think you need. Way more, and I know sometimes it's like brutal when you're wrapping because it's like it's okay, coming. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're like, oh, I'm hitting the table. Oh, okay. I'm hitting the table. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because you've given yourself so much space, but better, better, more, more, more material to work with than than not enough, right? Absolutely. Okay, again, so the, my counter is going to go on the opposite side of my fly, away from me on the side of the fly. So I'm just going to tie that in the same length. At, oh, that was not good. Two loose wraps over, make sure 
sitting nice on the side. So and tie it in right on the side of my fly. Okay, as you can see, they're all 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 my tying in points for all my ribs are all been in the same. I've ended them all in the same place up here where I thought was the back half of my body. Bring my thread back in. Now, Chris, do you do you when you tie when you tie your thread back, do you make sure to cover all your tinsel all the way back? You mean uh, oh, because you're gonna be wrapping floss or something over it. Um, yeah, I like to just so I know it's not gonna like move position around the hook. Yeah. Uh, so I'll I'll wrap over, but I guess you could get away if you're like if you're careful about not. Yeah. Huh, I I, cool. I I personally have never been too picky about making sure that like it's completely covered and everything's all nice and every every turn is laying down beside each other and it's completely covered. Yeah. You know, as you can see, I don't know if you can see it. Like, I don't have it completely covered. There's little, oh yeah, little bits and bits and pieces showing in there. So, I'm not to me, to me, that's not, um, it's not a, it's not a deal breaker for me or anything like that. You know, so I know some guys will be like, oh, you know, it, it alters the way your floss will look in the water, and and it, it, you know, that little bit of shine coming through gives it that little bit of a different hue to it or something. But I, I wouldn't fundamentally disagree with that but i don't think it's consequential to how the fly is going to fish yeah for, i mean for a display fly obviously it's a little different but for a fish yeah fly, no I, I'll, I'll admit i'm a little on the lazy side when i'm talking about fish <laughs> plus <laughs> okay so now i got now i got all my ribs in i am going to uh select my in. so here i actually have uh some purple some purple slapping I actually have two types of slapping in front of me right now. You can see they're both purple, but obviously each dye job is completely different. So uh, I do find, you know, per this is probably your more standard purple slapping, and this is a little bit more of a very uneven dyed slapping. But I did find that, you know, even though it's unevenly dyed, you know, it's got this kind of cool little color to it, right? So, you know, if you do see any materials, if you're in the in in the shop looking for anything and you see like, oh, this pack is looks a little bit different dyed from this other pack. You know, sometimes that little different shade of color um, kind of pops out a little bit and it's, it's almost like a one off. You know what I mean? So but I'm going to go with uh, the purple here. So when I'm selecting my. see here so when i'm selecting my slapping is this is this no good case okay okay so i do like to i like to i like to select my slapping and look for these longer nice flowy fibers so i don't know if you can see that on this feather i just selected right here chris how nice and nice and long those feathers those bottom feathers are because I am going to be tying in this from the butt, right? So I am going to go ahead and pick that one. Get it out. There you go. So another thing, when uh, one thing I like about my Ryax is when I'm picking my schlappen. Let's get rid of this. No, my garbage on the wrong side. I do. You see this uh, on the bottom of this on this feather? It's got this nice kind of like almost marabou stuff on it. So I, when I'm tying in from the back, I actually really like this stuff hanging off the back end of my fly. I find it the way it pulses and kind of moves in the water when your fly is kind of going up and down in the water column, swimming side to side. Especially if it's coming, you know, when it's more or less when it's moving up and down like this, it kind of just gives it this very tantalizing look to it. So I do really like this stuff right here. Again, when you do get into the bottom end of the schlappen, um, the schlappen feather, you will start to see that the stem does get quite thicker. Okay. Um, again, you know, it's just about selecting your selecting your feather. You don't, you know, if it, if the if the stem is like thicker than this i don't know how good you can see and how 
thick you can see that is. But I typically wouldn't use anything more thicker than this. You know, you can use like a, a rooster cock for this, and but the rooster cock does have a lot of a thicker stem. I think I have one right here. Let me show you. Uh, give me one sec. Here we go. So you can see this is a rooster cock. Nice long feathers, but again, beautiful, some nice marabou style stuff on the bottom right here. But you can see how much thicker that butt of that stem is, right? Which will obviously bulk up your fly, look kind of odd. Uh, I have in the past kind of just taken an X-Acto knife and kind of just sliced it a little bit just to thin out that stem a little bit. Like when you when you do that, then you just make your you do make your stem a lot more brittle. Uh, so when you do go to turn it, it you could it could snap on you. Um, but you can see it's kind of I don't know if you see how I'm breaking it. It's quite stiff right there. So I'm going to stick with the schlappen. Okay. Again, since I am tying in from the butt, and I'm going to be uh, make sure I'm doing this right. Yep. <laughs> I'm tying, I'm tying, I'm, I'm hackling my feather in from the butt. I want to make sure since I'm going to my right like this, I want to keep, if the concave side is down, I'm going to reserve my left side of the feathers. And that means I'm going to strip down my right side. So I'm going to go ahead and strip down my right side. Okay. So concave is concave right now is, you know, facing, facing away from the viewers. So I am going to be keeping this side of my, so as you're looking at the feather when you're doing it, it's curving away from yourself. Yes. Yeah. You got it. Okay. So I'm going to go strip down half of this. Again, when you do strip one side down, you do want to be quite delicate at the top because you could internally strip everything away and really just damage your whole feather. And hopefully I don't do that right here. Again, I'm not a pro tire or anything like that, so I do make mistakes and I do, I do get lazy sometimes. Let's just be honest. Okay, so as you can see, I stripped down by one side. Okay, beautiful. So I am actually gonna. There is quite a bit of this marabou on the bottom. I don't want that much, so I'm gonna go ahead and take off another, let's say, quarter inch of it. Okay. And I am now going to tie this in. So actually, before I before I tie this in, the original pattern for this fly is actually this is tied in from the tip at the front and then hackled back and then caught with your counter and brought forward. The counter pulls it in and then you would bring your counter forward. That would give your that would give the body of your fly a different look because instead of the counter being um, this is still the counter, but the the ribbing that's going the opposite way of uh, the rib going the opposite way of the ribs tied forward, it you wouldn't have a tinsel look to it. It would have the stem look to it. Yeah, I suppose. Okay. But, I mean, if you did that too, you'd also end up with a thinner body, right? Because you weren't catching. Yes, ex you got it. Yeah. So I I I I prefer this is actually the easier way and maybe the lazy way. To be completely honest, <laughs> yeah, I do it. So must be. <laughs> <laughs> right, but uh, I am going to tie. I am going to tie my uh, my feather in from the back, and then hackle it for it. So I'm going to take my slapping my slapping feather, tie it in from the butt, right on top of my feather. Two loose wraps to get it in place. Third one comes around, really anchors it in. And again, I'm going to tie this in to the same point where I think my back half of my body is, is going to finish. Right there. Again, tie this forward, tie it back, really anchor it in. Again, I'm not, not picky and saying, you know, it should all be perfectly covered because it's not, as you can see, and like so. Okay. Now, I am going to take my uh, fluorescent orange uh, string yarn. Okay. And this is my back half of my body. So what I've done is I've brought my thread now to where I think, uh, the back half of my body is going to 
start or finish, I guess you could look at it both ways. Um, and then I'm going to tie my, my fluorescent orange string yarn at this point, I'm going to wrap it back and wrap it forward again. Okay. Again, this is another, t another thing where how much material I actually think I need. I, I always overshoot it. So I'm going to pull off like a significant amount. Okay. Again, better to work with more than not enough. And actually the original pattern for the Eagle Rock has actually one third, one quarter floss, one quarter yarn, whole front half is uh, seal fur, I'm pretty sure. So I'm going to tie this in right there. A couple good turns, really get it anchored in there. Got being, there we go. Like so. And now I'm going to wrap this back, all the way back, every single turn, just like with my, the way I was doing my, my, ta my uh, tag end. Every turn comes in, making sure it's nice and tight, laid in to my previous wrap. And I'm going to go back all the way. And why? Is my charger not working? I just got to message on my phone saying that my battery's down to 20 percent let me just tie this in and yeah. should be enough to get through this at least <laughs> yeah okay so as you can see good nice tight wraps one against the other from my previous wrap all the way back again i don't know if you've seen <clears throat> my last fly i had tied but uh the color combo of red, orange, purple, black, and a hint of blue to me has always has always been a winner. Yeah. And you can see this color combo is starting to turn out that way right now. Okay. Okay, all the way to the back. You can see even with how much yarn you pulled off there, you're still gonna be cutting it close. You know what I mean? Be cutting it close. Uh, you'll be good. And I and and I actually thought I was I was a little generous on that one. <laughs> oh, uh, I, I'm gonna make it, but yeah, it's barely. gonna be a it's gonna be a very close one. <laughs> well, it's a good illustration of what you're explaining before. <laughs> yeah. Oh, see, look, it's getting real close to my fingers right now like really close oh well done oh look at that look at that eh look how much i was left with <laughs> give me one give me one second here chris i don't know why Sorry, I was on mute. But <laughs> I was gonna say, just as Winston was fixing his charger, but if you have questions, drop them in the chat. We'll get around to them here. But Winston, you're doing a great job cool. explaining, so I don't anticipate there being many. Perfect. So now I am going to uh, throw my body in, uh, my front half of my body, and uh, this is where a little bit more of the you know modern, modern spay fly comes in. A little bit of. Uh, you know, built on the classic. So I am going to use, uh, I'm actually a big fan of this stuff right now, is uh, the Senyo Fusion Dub Midnight. So I don't know if you guys can see it. Like so. It's got a little touch of blue, a little bit of almost like, you know, angel hair running through it. It's quite nice. Okay. So I'm going to throw this in a dubbing loop. So. so we can't really see that against your shirt because it's white on white, but um, for anyone who hasn't seen a dubbing loop. Okay, so, yeah, so a dubbing loop, I am just going to take, uh, I'm going to pull off a good amount of thread. I don't know if you can see it. Yep. Okay, I'm going to take my index and my middle finger, and I'm going to put a, make it kind of like a triangle. I'm going to 
give it a little twist and then put my and then wrap my thread forward like this to create this loop like so and then i'm gonna tie it in place like this terrific so i don't know i don't okay. know if you guys can uh can you see that can you see the loop now chris yeah it's, it's just oh there we go yeah great okay. i was gonna say we do have that like so. uh a video on making those and uh yep. they've, they've been shown in so many live streams so i think people are probably pretty solid there but i always like to cover it yep <clears throat> so there's my dubbing loop so I've, I've tied in my loop into where uh, i'm gonna add my dubbing in and then i'm gonna bring my thread forward to my uh tying in point so i'm gonna end it around right about here i do like to give myself a little bit more room in the front than i think you know again like i said not not a pro tire uh, my heads you know sometimes they're big sometimes they're small sometimes i crowd my eye but you know as long as i get my line in there and i can fish the fly it's still pretty good like so and then i'm going to take my uh dubbing tool the stone uh stone foe thanks to the elite dubbing tool like so a little bit of uh my waspy dubbing wax so a little bit in there okay and now i'm going to take my senior fusion midnight just kind of break it up a little bit get it all nice really sparse like so and then i'm going to add this in clump by clump into my dubbing loop. So I'm just gonna add in a little bit. Like so. A little clump. Like so. Another clump. Again, I like to make my dubbing loop with my dub a little bit more than I need. I always end up with having cutting off quite a bit, and I just kind of reserve it and pull it out and put it back into my box. I don't like the way that one was looking. Get a little bit tighter. There we go. That. So as I'm putting this dub in, I'm pulling down on my dubbing tube tool so that it's closing my... Uh, my dubbing loop to, to lock my fibers in place, to lock the hair in place, I should say. So like so, let me throw one more in there for good measure. Okay. Give it a good spin, put everything, make sure it's kind of even, put it up to the top. I don't know if you guys can see that, it's not hasn't been spun yet but now i'm going to give her a good spin like so everything gets nice and tight there we go it's going to go with my fingers and kind of just really quickly run through it pull any loose fibers out that i might not want okay and then cool thing about this dubbing tool is when you start wrapping it's got this little pivot point in the head and when you start to wrap, it kind of just goes like that. It's getting nice, clean, even wraps. Again, so I'm gonna, at, my, at the back, I would like to go back like almost a half a turn just to catch in any, to cover anything I've missed maybe. Hopefully I didn't miss anything there. Nope. Oh yeah, a little bit. There we go. So. And then the same thing with my my yarn body or my tag and you know clean wraps not super tight to one another because you will pick it out a little bit but and then wrap it forward okay So there, there we go. I always feel like I don't have this 
hook tight enough in my vice. As you can see, I thought my orange was my orange and my front body were about half, but as you can see by just looking it, I'm probably a little bit off on my proportion here. I'd say I'm a little bit bigger on my on my orange part of my body. So I'm gonna tie this in. A couple good wraps, one in the back, one in two in the front type of thing. And snip. So in all this extra dubbing that comes out of my dubbing tool like this, I kind of just pull it out. And I will save it. So I end up with a little bit of extra there. Okay. And I'm just going to grab my fibers that were sticking forward from my dubbing and just pull them back and throw two, three more wraps in there like this. Like so. That's looking fishy. Sorry, so I hate to ask. Um, the uh, Your shirt there is getting a little bright. Uh, I think okay. next step we might lose some uh, some detail there. Is there any Better? I yeah. Yeah, I think that's better. Okay. Cool. Back to okay. you. Okay. All right. Now, uh, where was I? Okay, so we got our front half of our body on, okay? Now I'm going to start bringing uh, forward all my ribs. So I'm going to start with my medium flat tinsel. And I'm going to wrap it. And I'm going to leave a decent amount of space in between each turn, as you can see. So I think there will be probably about four ribs on this fly. Well, it's four on my side here, maybe five. Like so. Okay, yeah, four ribs. Now I'm gonna follow that medium flat rib with my small oval tinsel, just slightly behind it, maybe about, you know, I'd say two millimeters behind it, like so. Tied in. Okay. Now at this point, before I start bringing my hackle forward, I actually like to go through with uh, just a pick and kind of just pick out a little bit of my dubbing, for my body. Give it a little bit more of a buggy look. Whether it's a little pick or my little, my pony brush. Brush it out a little bit, like so. Okay. Take this up, pick this out a little bit right here. So make sure when you're picking out some dubbing in between the ribs and stuff that you don't pick out a rib. Okay. Okay. Now I am going to take my slapping so i like to grab it by the tip of the feather take my my comb brush through it like this really get the fiber separated from everything can you see that chris okay i actually like to do one full turn stationary Ooh, you can see this. This is a quite a robust stem on that turn. You probably, you, you guys might have not seen it, but I could feel it when I went to go turn it. And now I am going to take this 
stem. And I am going to follow the inside of my medium flat, making sure the stem lays nice and snug in tight to that medium flat rib, medium flat tinsel rib. Can you see that the way I'm, the way I'm wrapping it? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so you're kind of putting it between those two tinsels that you, uh, yeah, kind of, but right trying there. tighter to the flat, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. Like so. There we go. There we go. Another one, like so. And every time I make a turn, just like any uh, spay fly I tie or, or anything when I'm hackling, I like to, as I turn, I like to kind of manipulate and brush my feathers back. Like so. So, and then once I actually get up to my collar, so to speak, I actually like to do one full turn. Like that. You can see our body of our spade fly has really started to take form now. And there we go. Body hackle is in. Body hackle is in. Put them up. Take my little comb, kind of brush everything back. Okay. And you can, how does that look on that side, Chris? Looks good. We're just, yeah, super buggy. Okay. Again, uh, you know, Ryak, Caroline, Starfly is supposed to mimic like uh, a crustacean prawn pattern, essentially. And uh, one of my favorite ones to, to fish, little style of flies. So there we go. Now I'm going to throw my counter in. So since I, since I am tying on a rotary vise, I don't like to actually wrap my counter, like wrap it away from me. I kind of just like twist my, my vise itself. So I always like to throw in, you know, four to five extra turns in the front. So as I counter, I'm unwrapping my front. I don't end up unwrapping my whole fly and all the materials kind of not a good look and not a, not a fun time. Okay. So my counter with my, uh, with a pick in hand, I am going to start countering. So I literally just hold with my, with my uh, dominant hand, I would hold my counter in one position and with my other hand, my left hand this is right now, just turn my fly, have my counter on a 45 degree angle and kind of just work it through my fly. Every time I make a turn, move, pick away any fibers that I find are in the way. Like so actually this one looks like it just needs to come over here. There we go. Okay. Like so, 45, just kind of working it all the way through my fly. So. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but every time I make a turn, I'm kind of moving some fibers out of the way. Not even, I wouldn't even say a turn, more like a half turn. I start pulling away some fibers. What is stuck there? So. Like so. Just moving away the fibers. Trying not to get them caught down by my counter rib. You know, it happens sometimes you get some fibers count caught in your counter. You can kind of go back through, pick them out, pull them out a little bit. So. So. 
ですよ。So, and then I'm going to tie this off right in the, on the side. My fly. Right on the bottom, actually, right there. And that's in. There's my counter. Nice. So, There's the body of our fly. Yeah. Any questions? Slow down a little bit. Looking pretty good. No, looking looking great. See, so, yeah, I just to uh, kind of reiterate the purpose of the counter, why we would bother going through all that effort there, just to kind of solidify things and make sure that stem's not going to break, right? Yeah, so, yeah, the importance of the counter is, you know, after you fish the fly a couple times or after you hook a couple of fish, you know, flies take a beating, right? Um, the last thing you want to do if you don't put that counter in is that, you know, you bust the stem on your on your body hackle and you lose your whole, the whole essentially the whole profile of your of your fly. Um, you know, the whole the whole effect of the fly is gone because, you know, you, you've busted it. With the counter, what happens is, you know, after a few fish, after fishing it a little bit, say you do bust a piece of the stem off your counter, you know, you'll just only lose that little bit of section of your fly, right? Um, it also keeps it in place very snug and very well as well. So um, I always counter any spay fly I'm tying with, with long flowy hackles off the back or, or a significant amount of body hackle. I always counter it, whether it's with medium flat, sorry, medium oval, fine oval, small oval tinsel or, you know, I I always throw the counter in there. It, it does take it. It is that little bit of an extra step, but you know, last thing you want to do if if that's the only fly that's working for you that day, and the first fish you get on it just destroys it and throws your whole thing, and then you kind of it's nice you got the fish, but you know your confidence kind of is now built around this fly, right? And, and let's face it, you know when you're swinging swinging flies for steelhead or any sort of adronomous species, uh, confidence is key. So the last thing you want to do is lose all your confidence and have to put this fly away into your box and pull out another fly. Yep, well said. Cool. Well, I guess we're getting close to that stressful part. Pardon? We're getting close to the stressful part. Oh, yeah. Okay, so... <laughs> I've noticed, actually, that a few more people have started to tune in. I think they're just waiting to see if you can pull this one off. <laughs> So the funny thing is I was telling Chris, I was like, man, Chris, I tied a couple of these flies in the last couple of days and first shot, you know, boom, wings went on, wings went on, wings went on first time, you know, and, and of course, now that I go live on it, you know, I'm going to screw it up, but no, nope, we'll sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I am actually now going to throw in my throat and I like to just use a little bit of uh, dyed flank. You know what, actually, maybe I'll just keep it with the natural. I'm going to go with a natural teal flank. Oh, look at this. I had a nice one on my desk. Again, uh, I like to, when I'm throwing in my uh, throat here, uh, since I'm tying it in by the tip, I am going to strip away my left side of the fly. Again, like Chris said, concave away from you. Uh... I'm pulling and tying in by the tip, strip off the left left side, okay? Because you are going to tie it by the tip. So as you can see, I have my natural teal flank. I'm going to pull off the bottom bits here. Strip them down. Okay, like so. I'm going to strip away my left side, which is this side. And I'm just going to grab my tip, pull my feathers down. So, and I'm going to tie my feather in.
from the tip here. That. And I'm only going to make two turns with this. Make sure it's sitting on top, two loose wraps manipulated on top, like so. Okay. I, I've never used really used hackle pliers that much. I always just use my fingers. So just two turns of my teal flank. That's one. Again, as I come around, pulling my fibers back. That's two. Tie it in from the top. Like that. All right, now here comes the nerve wracking part. The part typically when everybody gets very frustrated with a fly, and don't get me wrong, in the past I have started a fly like this, <clears throat> one set of mallard goes on, doesn't work out. Second set of mallard goes on, doesn't work out. All right, at that point, I'm like, I'm gonna go make myself something to eat, and I'm gonna come back to it, okay? Hopefully that doesn't happen this time. So I like to just brush everything. Like so. Okay. Now, a couple things about uh, bronze mallard I've found. So as you can see here, I have what I, what I like to believe two pretty well matched pairs of bronze mallard. You can see... The, the shading from light to gray, the, the light to dark is kind of equal and similar on each feather. You know, I like, I like to make that, I like to make that. Sometimes, sometimes actually you'll notice that they're actually not even the same size, but here's another decent one. Okay. You can see the, the, the darkness on each, the gray patch in the middle is quite, is quite, is quite uniform. Um, I don't know if you can see the actual barring on them but uh the actual like stri striations within the feather are kind of almost very similar as well too um you'll notice that these have already been uh prepped and paired um so these came from a pack like this you know uh right here of bronze mallet i don't know if you can see it but if you can see on the inside of the feathers how there are some almost uh, folded in fibers into one another so what I like to do, and I think this, especially if you do get into tying a lot of um, bronze mallard, uh, bronze mallard wing spay flies, um, I like to take the time and I like to actually pull out all my feathers. You can see there's I'm missing quite a few feathers in this pack. Excuse me, these came out of this this pack right here. What I like to do is I like to actually steam all my bronze mallard. Okay. Um, you know, I know, I know sometimes you'll be in, <clears throat> you'll be in a shop and, you know, the color and the color between, you know, from gray to dark looks fantastic. Both, both sides look great, but you know, the feathers inside are all kind of like folded and not, and they don't look like they're perfect. You know, a lot, a lot of, a lot of guys and gals I'll, I'll find will be like, Oh, I don't want that pack because, um, the feathers in there are not perfect. Right. To me, I'm like, that's not that's 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 a little small issue that I can I can work with and I can fix. So what I do is typically if I see I look more for the coloring is, is what I look for. Right. Yeah. And obviously they need to be matched properly. But if the feathers are kind of bent over each other and so on, kind of like these ones in the in the pack right here, they're kind of like bent over each other. As soon as you go to steam them. You know, you kind of you kind of weaken those fibers and that natural like webbing in, be in between them. And they kind of all form back to their natural state, right? And you'll get that nice concave. They'll all be perfect. And you'll see that, you know, like, wow, that in the package, the feather didn't look that great. But after I took a little bit of time of prepping and steaming it, uh, they're, they're looking perfect, absolutely beautiful. Um, so what I like to do is I like to steam all my feathers like so, like natural, just out of the pack, no, nothing plucked off, um, none like that. After they've been steamed, I go, I go through them all and I start matching them. I start matching them. And once I have them all matched, I just 
take a little bit of painter's tape and I kind of just tape the bottom of the stems. And that once I have them all matched, then I'll go through them and start plucking them down and kind of getting ready for, for me to use when I'm ready to tie. Um, I have in the past, and I don't suggest doing this, doing this step before you steam them. Because when you do strip them down, you do take pieces of the stems with you. So it's a lot harder to match. Um, I like to match my feathers. I look at them from the from the front, like so, for the color I for the coloring to make sure they're even. I also like to look at the back to see how the natural curvature of the stem is. So if you do strip them down, you're taking a little bit of that stem and you might actually mismatch quite a bit of feathers. So I like to leave my feathers whole when I match. And once I have them matched and steamed, then I start stripping them down and start prepping them. Just a little, a little extra step that, that will help you down the road when it comes time to actually tying your fly. Okay. Good tip. A um, couple of quick questions for you before we get going. Uh, yep. First two for me, and then we have one for Claudio. Um, for somebody who hasn't steamed feathers before, you want to just quickly describe the process? Okay, so what I like to do is I like to take a, a small like a, a small pot, like a small saucepan, essentially. Fill it with like you know an inch or two of water. Bring that water up to a boil, and then I will take like a little small, um, almost like a, a basket strainer. I, I, I wish I... Do you want me to get it for you and show you? But yeah, I mean, uh, I think we can describe it, but like a small strainer kind of thing. Yeah, like a small strainer with yeah. on, and I sit that on top of my pot with you know about an inch or two of boiling water, mm -hmm. and I let that water boil. I put the strainer in, and I just throw all my feathers in there, and then I'll just take like a pot lid or a piece of uh, newspaper or something and put it on top. Turn my heat down a little bit, and kind of just move my pan around so. Uh, the steam from that water evaporating kind of goes into there, loosens all the feathers up, and then uh, then I will take it off. See it, we'll see what it's looking like. Oh, you know, maybe it needs a another minute in the steam. Let it go. Do that process over again for another minute, and then pull my feathers out and lay them all over my counter in the kitchen, and then start pairing them. Um, I do the exact same process when I am. Uh, steaming all my golden pheasant crests as well yeah so again i steam all my golden pheasant crests as well for my tails and stuff and then i i lay them over a water bottle lay them over a water bottle lay them over a water bottle just so they get that natural perfect stem down the middle and that nice curvature to them <clears throat> you know if you have a if you have a bamboo steamer or uh you know like one of those dim sum steamer which is a bamboo steamer i'm, sh I'm sure that would work too Essentially, you're just trying Anything to build any sort of, some you know, <laughs> steam coming off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the other, I guess it wasn't really a question I was going to, to just mention, but cool thing about steaming is you can use it with, I mean, you can illustrate it there with the uh, golden feather with any natural fiber, like not even just feathers, like theoretically anything natural steaming yeah. good work to, to get back their natural shape. So if people have yeah. other, you know, things that are, not damaged, but maybe a little twisted or misshapen or whatever. So it's a cool, uh, cool uh, great, great point, Chris. Another, another, another great one is, um, you know, pheasant or Amherst. Yeah, pheasant yeah. or or turkey. Amherst, you got it. Turkey, yeah. another great one. You know, you can steam. Actually, my wife just brought down. I think she, I guess she's upstairs watching the thing. She just brought down the steamer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, but, uh, yeah she just brought down the little the little basket here i'll grab it for yeah you. sure right here so essentially i put this yeah into my small yeah into my small sauce pot right and then there's you know about here would be like the boiling water you know and it comes up put a little lid on it gather that steam up you know so on and so on and then that's how i do it awesome and then we do have a question from claudio who's asking if there are any alternatives to bronze mallard I mean, it's kind of a unique feather, like a direct yeah. substitute. Not really, but you could use other things. I don't know if you, that's... you, um, I, I, I can't say I've used, I've used anything else 
for it, but uh, I've never used a substitute for Bronze Mallard. Is there even a substitute for Bronze Mallard? Like, I don't, I don't think, I wouldn't say there's a direct substitute, but just tying yeah. supplies in general. Like, if you have some really big teal, or if you have some really good gap yep. wall, or like yep. Mallard flank, I don't really like yep. the look of any of those as much as Bronze Mallard. Yeah. Or even like a turkey, right? I mean, turkey is way exactly. more opaque and stiff. It would give you a completely yep. different look, but you know, you could use things. What what would be things that you're looking for for like a winging fiber? Like what what would you say are the common themes there? Uh, uh, I would say the biggest thing when I'm looking for winging wing wing fiber is um, is the way I'm going to set my wing. Mm-hmm. Okay, so bronze mallard is, is 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 you're setting your wings low, right? Other not like you know when you're going with turkey you can kind of set them high right so if i'm looking to you know set my wings low i would stick i'm I'm looking for that very long natural curvature that flows back that's almost going to cup yeah. the top of my oh, something a little on the softer side too yes 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 on the softer side as well too right but uh but too soft is not good yeah it'll fold on you so uh, exactly yeah Two socks goose, is not like you could do it with goose you could do it and uh, it wouldn't be that easy yeah but I, th- I think i think i think you could do it with goose but again you know the fly is is supposed to represent almost the shell part yeah. of, a, of a crustacean right so with goose you might get away with it a little bit if you can kind of almost couple momentum to sit like you get a little bit of, a of your as a substitute them. yeah it almost you know be like I mean? half spay, half D kind of thing at that point. Exactly, but. exactly. Kind of like um, what's a what's a fly tied like that? Like a Dallas. Yeah. You know, like like the original Dallas calls for cinnamon turkey, set low and almost cupped, yeah. right? So uh, that you can maybe get away with, but you know, typically you can even if do... you're looking for a bronze mallard yeah. substitute for this fly, a Ryak, a Lady Caroline. I mean, I bet uh, you. I, Pardon? Sorry, go, sorry. What I was gonna say is, I mean, you could even, you know, if you didn't want to mess around with the, the mallard, um, if you found it tr- tough to work with or anything, you could do this almost like the one you did last week, right? You could do like yes, a but, shell back with a golden pheasant over the top, just feathers, exactly, full feathers, it, exactly, set low, right? Yeah, set low, Flat, like a like a GP style. But exactly, yeah, Claudio, yes. um, best substitutes would be like waterfowl flank feathers. So yeah. kind of like what the bronze mallard is. Bronze mallard's from the top of a mallard. There's mallard yeah. flank from the flanks. Teal, yeah. tadwall, those are all kind of similar, but not quite. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and there there is a lot of spay patterns out there that actually call for oh, sure. godwill yeah. flank feathers set low and tented, you know, and uh, it would be, that would probably be your best substitute. If not, I would, I would tie this fly. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put turkey on it. I wouldn't put goose on it. I would actually go with, the golden pheasant yeah just tied flat or do it just like tied it flat. Um, you yeah. could do it like a uh, a dragon's tooth or something with them kind of tented yep. but that's finicky that's so finicky so, y- yeah they awesome. start rolling on you and <laughs> I, I, and a lot of people will be quite surprised on how difficult it is to tent golden pheasant breast feathers it looks easy but it's not man because again they're soft and sometimes they get too soft and they just start folding on each other right so, uh, but yeah, I, I would stick with, you know, especially if, if you're not that experienced with it and you just kind of, you like the profile and you like the way this fly is looking, I would just have your golden feathered breast feathers laid flat on top, you know, to kind of give it that shell back look on it. Right. And, uh, I bet you'd catch a fish too. I, I don't see why it wouldn't, you know, the general practitioner has been around for centuries and a heavy producer too. So yeah. Cool. Okay. I'll let you get back. Anything more? Nope. Okay. <laughs> now, now, now comes the, the you got a drum roll, Chris, going or. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, fun. so I got I got my matched uh, bronze mallard here. Okay, and essentially, I would call this, you know, right here. You can see, these are those fibers kind of folded in on each other right there. I'm just kind of working them out. I would call this essentially my sweet spot you know that's where i'm going to get the most the most use the most length the best curvature and probably 
the best, the easiest places to to pick my feathers to set them is is coming off of right here. Okay. So another another thing I like to do with uh, with especially when I'm tying on 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 larger irons, you know, uh, if I go up to a size one uh, blue hair, and if I'm tying a three aught uh, Daiichi Alec Jackson hook. If I'm tying on one aught uh, HE2 blind eyes or any larger blind eye hooks, um, I actually like to put two sets of these on there. Okay, so I put an underwing and an overwing. Okay, um, now if I was tying a Lady Caroline on a Daiichi Alec Jackson size five or size seven, I would just put one set of wing. Okay, so I am going to put two sets on here. Okay, so I am going to go ahead and snip away from my what I called my prime zone or, you know, the money spots, so to speak, which is that. Okay, so there's one, another prime zone on here. So again, this. Okay, now I got what I believe to be my money spot of my bronze mallards. Okay, so I am gonna set. I like to cut my. I like to set my my underwing, my first set of wings, a little shorter than my my overwing. Okay. And obviously, again, <clears throat> you know, you can sit here and try to count each fiber as you go through them. But let's be honest, like, you're probably never going to get each side equal. So I kind of like just to do a little rough count. I kind of like to, it's not like turkey where you can actually, you can really feel how many fibers with, the, with, with your pick you're going over. You can lightly, faintly feel these. And I'm going to roughly count out that, say, and I like to make my other, my underwing a little skinnier than my top wing okay so i'm going to count that out so I, I don't know if you can see that i pulled out a little strip but i'm just going to give that a quick count that's one two three four five six seven eight, it's about 15 fibers right there okay i'm going to cut that and i and i've, I've seen um bronze mallard set two ways i've seen guys actually cut it off the stem and set them not a fan of it fibers move on you get all thing i like to leave that little you can, uh, can you see that chris that little piece of stem right there kind of holds the fiber intact okay yep i'm with you on that for sure okay so i got that one i'm going to take my other side cut it from the bottom again i'm going to count out about 15 fibers i can already tell you that's too many okay I'm going to count them out. Fourteen. That's about fourteen there too. Fourteen to fifteen. Okay. Now. Now, as you can see, one side is quite longer than the other, okay? So you need to match up, have the tips coming up. As you can see, you know, the, the barring is a little different from here to here, okay? That is, you know, maybe this feather should be like that, but I'm not going to do it like that. I'm going to try and make this work, okay? So I like to take my, my two slips like this. I like to push them together so they're kind of parallel to each other. So. And so the longest fibers are on the inside, right? Yes. Okay, like so. So I have them like this, kind of set. Okay, tips are all even and uniform. I like to switch my hands. You know, now as you can see now, I'll show you the backside kind of all 
together like this. I like to lay them over. Again, this is going to be a little shorter than my, my, my top wing. And I, with my left hand and my index and my thumb, I like to grab the feathers and kind of have them naturally cut the top of my fly, like so. Okay. It's looking pretty good. Working it. Constantly switching my hands, making sure they're sitting on top. Both tops are meeting each other. I feel like I got it in place pretty good. So, and I'm going to do two loose wraps. And one thing I like is on my on my third wrap, when I'm starting to tighten up, I like to pull up instead of pulling down, okay? And then I'll pull, I'll let it hang down like this. Okay, I find when I pull up, I don't, I, I don't, if, my, if I pull up, I'm pulling, I'm kind of pulling everything together. If I pull towards me, pull away from me, I'm going to force my, my fibers to roll on me, which, which then you, you end up with a lot more problems. So... See here. Okay, so those that's in there right now. And what I like to do now that I feel like I got it in there pretty tight, one more little wrap, and then I just kind of manipulate a little bit, move them if I need to, like so. And one nice my underwing. Yeah. Pardon? I was gonna say as annoying as mallard can be to work with, you've got it in there very nicely there. But uh, one of the really nice things is just how soft it is. It's so easy to compress, right? Like compared yep. to turkey and stuff, it's just yes. It's so soft, it's so easy to, to compress as long as you keep it straight. Like you're saying, it's it, great. It it, it will, and, and as long as yeah, exactly as long as you keep it straight and pull up. Don't don't pull towards you. Don't pull down. Pull up on it. Like I I, I, I found over over the years, pulling towards me, pulling away from me, pulling down. I find pulling up is 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 by far the most effective to try to keep them lined up properly. As you can see, my, my, uh, my the size of my slips, you can tell that one side is a little bit longer, is a little bit thicker than the other, but the way they are sitting on there right now is quite dead in the middle. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm happy with that. Again, just my underwing. And I'm going to go and cut my ends off. I know, I know some guys like to leave these on. I don't like to leave them on. Uh, my tag ends, I find they do get in my way when I do, when I do go to set my next, my, next, my next set of wings. Okay. So like so. Okay. Now I am going to, I am probably going to pull these off the top end of these feathers. Okay. Again, I, now I'm going to cut these slips a little bit thicker than my last one. That wasn't very good. There we go. Okay, so again, there's a slip. Okay, then I'm gonna give it a little bit of a rough count. I'm gonna see how many I have here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 12, 13, 14. I got about 17 fibers there. Okay. Same thing here. I can tell you right now, that is a little bit bigger. So again, just counting on my fibers here. that again you don't have to count out your fibers you can eyeball them to make sure they look a little bit similar and even this one's starting to act up on me right here so sometimes i find when you know fibers come out of place you kind of just 
you just kind of stroke them a little bit like this it will they will work back into themselves and into the original position I can already tell these are a little ununiformed in size, so I'm going to trim my one side down. Okay. And there we go. So again, my two slips, same method. At the top, make sure they're all evened up. Okay. Nice and parallel to each other like this. Switch hands. Switch hands, okay. Get them laying on top. My left hand. Again, this one is gonna be a little bit longer than my under wing. Cup them right on top. Like so. And so total length on that, just basically body length? Uh, yep, body length pretty much just right to where I had my tag. My tag into my fly. Again, two soft wraps. Third one comes up, pull up. Can't really stress that enough. Okay. I'm going to take a look at it, see how it's sitting. Wow. That actually... The streak continues went on pretty damn good right there <laughs> okay and then that mallard is on i like the way it's sitting up i find if i'm going to put the pressure on my thread i will always pull it up and there you go beautiful there's, there, there's the bronze mallard on Whew. the nerve-wracking part is over okay <laughs> Trim this off, like so. Okay. Now this, now, now this part of the, now this little accent I like to throw on the fly. Um, you don't have to do it. I like to put in uh, kingfisher cheeks. Okay. This is my the the this is my the tail and the king, kingfisher cheeks are kind of like my own little my own my own little twist on the fly. Okay, so obviously, uh, we have you guys got a couple of these at the shop. No, the Kingfisher. Yep. I, I, I'm I'm a huge fan of this bird, and you really only typically use this bird for cheeks or little accents on flies. But man, do these little, almost turquoise blue feathers in the water do they ever illuminate? Like it's unbelievable. So I am off the back, which would be I would assume the cape right here. I'm going to pull off a little cheek off the left and the right, a little feather off the left and the right side. So I don't know if you can see this, but can you see that, Chris? I am going to pull this off. One little feather from there. And one little feather from right here. Problem with kingfishers is usually, you know, I don't have like fat fingers too. They're kind of long and, 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 and slender. You go to pull one feather, you end up taking off like two or three. So <laughs> don't let them go to waste. Should have showed you guys. So what I did there was, let me do this on the other one. So right here, you can see how kind of small these little feathers are. I just, you know, just like any other feather, strip down a little bit, like so. Oh, sorry. Just broke my feather there. Taking off that little bit of marabou. So, okay. You have to put this little tiny cheek. Okay. I got my left and I got my right side. For these, I do like to tie them in... Uh, one at a time, and I like to start away from me on the outside. 
so. And I kind of like to set them a little droopy. So, you see that, Chris? There we go. Here's my kingfisher cheeks. Okay, now my fly is complete. I like to just go around, trim them like this a little bit. Okay. Now I will finish my fly, throw a couple whip finishes into it. So, there we go. There we go. My head got away from me there a little bit. But there you have it. I like to, uh, I don't have a lighter on my desk. I usually have a lighter on my desk, but what, one thing I like to do with my lighter is I kind of just like to go at the front end of it. Any little fiber sticking on of it kind of just burns it away. I will now then throw a uh, black uh, head paint on there and let that sit and dry and then throw a clear coat on it. But uh, let me take this off. And give it a good look down the middle. I don't know. You see my wings and you can see it. So there is kind of my my version of a Eagle Rock Ryak uh, tied with a little bit modern twist on it and uh, quite a producer of uh, catching fish for me. So mm -hmm. hope you guys enjoyed that one. Really cool. A little bit of time, a little patience. Uh, obviously, you know, I've tied quite a bit of these and um, Ma bronze mallard always you know still gives me issues still gives me issues still gives me issues just something that you know no matter how many times you tie with it i find that you'll always have a little bit of problem but you can see bronze mallard came out pretty good well, there. off this time yeah <laughs> wicked so, yeah. cool yep. well, i hope everyone gives that one a shot or their own version of that one a shot yeah i i, I hope my little uh step by step of using of setting the bronze mallard and also preparing the feather prior to you using it uh will help you know fellow tires out there to 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 try and work with it and make it a little bit easier for them um but yeah like uh you know super fishy fly super productive confidence fly in my box amongst many um i find you know there's no there's no there's no, there's no point in having one fly in your whole fly box that you're confident in. It's just, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. pointless, to, honestly, to tell you the truth. You know, yep. I'm that guy that hooks a fish on one fly, takes it off, puts a new fly on, oh, yeah. and, you know, and people, and people look at me like, dude, why are you changing flies? You're catching fish on that fly. Well, what good is if I only catch one fish, if I catch fish on one fly, you know, like, what am I just, my box is going to be full of one fly. No, it doesn't, there's no diversity in it. Right. So, uh, but yeah, looking at it. There you have it. Very nice. Yeah. My, uh, uh, Eagle Rock. Yeah. Very nicely done. Great job. Thanks for coming back for that. It was a real treat for Thursday night. Um, for everyone watching, if you have questions, if you need any materials, you know where to come. We can help you out. Uh, Winston, I'm sure, would be happy to answer any questions that come through afterwards. As well. Oh, yeah. Um, 100%. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll pass you off this recipe to Chris later on yes. tonight. And then yeah, if well, anybody asks for it, you know, you'll have it up on the website or something. Like yeah, that. we'll so, get all the materials up there uh, sometime tomorrow then. And uh, yep. looking forward, we've got a few more streams. Uh, we have a few more people that we're looking to book. But at the moment, we've got a um, friend of the shop and local guide, Tyler Dunsmore, coming up for the uh, 8th of April. And uh, Ian Troop coming back for another uh, episode 
tying some streamers on the 25th. Uh, I think I might actually slide in there for one or two more sessions as well at some point. We had one actually last minute question from Oscar. So I'm just reading this over. Uh, okay, gotcha. Uh, similar question as last week with Nick Groves. Very different application, obviously, in this point. But um, if somebody's just fishing, like, I'm assuming this is a single hander uh, with, like, a regular floating line, uh, which rate sinking leaders would you recommend for swinging on the credit river? So, pretty specific. Credit's your home water, so you're pretty, pretty yes. well um, to this one. It would also depend on what's, uh, I'm assuming you're probably single, uh, swinging, you know, single hand with a nine foot eight weight or something like that. Uh, this time of year and moving forward into drop back season, um, you know, if the water's, you know, really got some momentum on it with the single hand, I would probably, I wouldn't fish a fly heavy, larger than this. And I would probably fish it on a, uh, on a single hand, probably a seven foot, uh, fast sink. Uh, you know, and then obviously throwing a couple men's in there to slow your line down to get your fly down a little bit. Now, if the water is starting to drop and getting really clear, I would definitely go to a either a full floating line with a you know a size three blue heron tied like this, or a size one and a half Alec Jackson uh, Daiichi tied in a Ryak or a Lady Caroline style, and you know, and a full floating line. If you feel that you know, I know some guys don't have confidence in full floating, you know, no sink tips or anything. I would then use a uh slow sink seven feet of the slow sink uh poly leader yeah uh eight, eight foot in the polys yeah eight, yeah. eight, eight foot poly sorry yeah 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 no I, I i agree with that myself and yeah especially getting into spring i think yeah a floating line is as things warm up per i mean personally yeah. i wouldn't really be fishing it right now it's pretty cold but yeah moving yeah. To, to warmer weather full float is it's just fine frankly um oh yeah yeah intermediate slow sink fast sink not much need for heavier yeah. than that other rivers, maybe yeah. not so much the credit. But yeah, no, that's that's yep. good. Cool, awesome. Glad you you're able to sneak and, that way in there, Oscar. Just before we signed off there. <laughs> and and actually, this is probably one of my favorite flies to fish on a dry line too. So when I say dry cool. line, full floating. Yeah, your fly is still getting down a bit. You're not necessarily. It, it is still getting down, right? Yeah. yeah. Just you're not dredging or anything. Cool. Exactly. Very yeah. good. Well, I hope everyone has a good night and everyone enjoyed that. And uh, we'll see you again soon for another one of these. Thanks a lot, guys. All right. See you on the water. Cheers. Take care.